This is one of the most famous motorcycle photos of all time. And while the actual motorcycle was lost for decades, the mystery of Wild Bill's strange and untimely death grew bigger and bigger. Not only was I able to track down this motorcycle, but I had a once in a lifetime opportunity to buy it which I squandered. But then I was given a second chance and I bought it. And let's try to get it running for the first time in who knows how long. And to fulfill the ultimate motorcyclist bucket list, I'm gonna try to ride it. All right, so I am so excited. Get the trailer loaded up to Klaus. Let's, uh, let's go get it. We're bringing home the road dog. So we jumped in Klaus and headed on our way to get the biggest motorcycle that I've ever owned. Come on, Eric, what you waiting for? Do we need to get the trailer? We got the money, got a camera, we need anything else? But every road trip needs road trip food. Go check it out, got some beef sticks, pork rinds, more beef sticks. Balanced breakfast is in the night. Let's go. We finally arrived and there it was, the prettiest motorcycle I'd ever seen. But now for the hard part, we have to take it out of his trailer and get it into mine. Is that park? I'm gonna use the only straps that I trust to tie down my road dog. Tech straps. This is so cool. This is this is how I knew the bike. I saw a picture of this at every dealership I've ever been to, sitting above their service center. That makes sense. That guy was seven too, because he make he doesn't make he makes that bike look kind of small, you know. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Then he showed us a portion of his really cool car collection. So we said our goodbyes. Hey, what would you tell me this thing for? And I tried to buy this truck from him, but he wouldn't sell it. Now we gotta go get this thing running so we can ride it. You can't really tell the story of this motorcycle without mentioning Buzz Walnick. Buzz was the founder of Walnick Classic Cycle Trader. And like everyone else who saw this picture was curious as to what that bike was, who built it, and where it was. So Buzz put an ad in his magazine to see if anyone could tell him any information about this motorcycle because he wanted to take a picture with it. And then a few months later, he got a phone call. The caller said, it's not called the locomotive bike, which is what, how Buzz described it because it kind of looks like a locomotive. They said, it's got a name. It's called Road Dog. And it's currently at my neighbor's house right now. Buzz thought this was huge. I mean, the fact that this thing still exists is such a big deal. But he had no idea what condition it was in and could not imagine what he finds when he gets there. So he made accommodations and traveled the whole way to Green Bay to try to take a picture of this motorcycle. So you, you, you might be thinking that this thing belongs in a museum where it's safe, where it's not gonna hurt anybody. You'd be wrong, it belongs in my garage where I'm gonna drive it every single day. But before we can get to that point, I gotta get this thing, before we can get it rideable, that's a process in itself, I gotta start this thing. And before I can start it, there's a few things I gotta do. One, we're gonna get a new battery. Two, I don't have a key for it. It's just a simple ignition switch. I should be able to go anywhere. And so that should be pretty simple. Let's go to the auto parts store, replace that. Then we can actually see what's going on. And two, as far as we know, this thing has not been ridden in possibly 30 years. So everything should work, but I'd like just to do a, just to test the health of the engine, do a, do a compression test, check the oil, you know, crank it over without any spark going in there just to see what's going on there. All right, so let's get that battery out. No, I don't, I, my friend Craig, from Beard and Mechanics. He's got himself a fancy, fancy tool pad. I don't need no fancy tool roll. Wrap my tools up. You only need a couple tools. Wrap my tools up in this uh, bandana. So I pulled out the old battery and then went to the auto parts store for a new one and a new ignition switch. And after stalling the switch and moving to the battery, I realized I had a problem. So Matt's saying sounds like negative ground, which that makes sense to me because I don't recall Chevy messing around with that stuff, which would mean that this, the old battery was put in wrong. I mean, this, would, this needs to be flipped, which is kind of concerning to me. That's, that's right. That's how it's supposed to be. If I put that on there, if I jammed it on there the way it wasn't, this thing would be, we would, it, it could have messed something up pretty bad. I want to see if I installed the switch right, but I don't want it to actually run because I've not really checked this thing over yet. So I pulled off the main distributor wire. Let's see if I can get this thing to turn on and crank. Did it do something? Are they? 
so that's nothing. Park. All right, we're doing something, something. Let's try to crank it again. All right, so this is about the moment where I think I could use some help, and I know I just a guy to help me. So I headed to the only other guy who I thought could help me get this thing rideable. And he just so happens to be the son of one of the last known people to ever ride it. Now we need to figure out how to get this thing off the trailer without anyone getting crushed or hurting the bike. But first we need to strap up the hydraulic rams so they don't fall down and get bent, broken, or snagged on anything. And then when it came to moving the bike off, luckily we found a lot of people who were willing to help. Yes. It ain't that bad. Straighten her out. Easy. Pretty good on it. All the way back into the shop. <laughs> what is this? 12 manpower? Yep. Continue right. holding it. <laughs> Sit on it, Sean. See what it's like to hold it up. I got You're it. You're off center a little bit. It's, it's low, not... you know? So, I yeah. mean, you got a low center of gravity. You keep leaning a little to the right. <laughs> you know, you're like, I don't know if your right leg's shorter than your really? left leg. I, feel, or I feel like I'm straight up. Are you... <laughs> is that straight? No, that's straight. Your eyes are off center. Really? Yeah, there's no <laughs> symmetry in your face. <laughs> <laughs> I figure you just hold it up while we work I'll on it. I'll just hold it up, yeah. yeah. Uh, let, me grab, let me grab some two bys and we got a block there, we got a block here. So we blocked up the bike so that we can safely work on it and start the process of getting this thing running. The first step was to make sure that it was topped off with all its proper fluids. And if you're wondering, this is Ken. He's Matt's old car expert. When you're working on old vintage motorcycles, it's good to have a Matt. When you're working on newer motorcycles, it's good to have a Craig. And when you're working on vintage motorcycles built by vintage cars, it's good to have a Ken. Ken, what do you think, uh, should we pull the plugs out? Take a look at the spark plugs. Well, I pulled this one. It's a little sooty, but not bad. It's a little sooty, Lynn. Maybe we'll hook the battery up, get the voltmeter to the, make sure we're getting fire to the coil, and then, I mean, we could pull a, a plug out and see if we're getting sparked through the coil. It is looking like it was just bone dry, and they never put oil back in it. Never put oil back in it. Oh, here's something else you guys never have to deal with. This is water cooled. Oh, so we need to check radiator. Yep. Yeah. I looked inside of it the other day. It wasn't the uh, best looking thing I've ever looked inside. I guess we could flush it. Just put a hose in it. Yeah. So one of the concerns that we have is we don't know who put that back together. I'm pretty sure after talking to um, Buzz, the guy who owned it, the guy who bought it off of Bill's mom, I'm pretty sure that, that no one wrote it since him. Every nut and bolt has to be checked and we can't assume really much about the bike. Uh, is it gonna actually get ridden today? You darn right it is. I have no idea. I have no idea, but I'm hoping so. We're going to try really hard. They need my help. It was the first time in 15 years that anyone had laid eyes on Road Dog. And it was hanging from the rafters of a shed suspended about three feet off the ground. And as far as I know, no one actually knows who hung it up there, which would be a pretty big feat because the thing weighs 3,200 pounds, which is what a Camry weighs. It's also impressive that the rafters would still hold this thing. If I had to guess, I would almost think that it was strategically put there and hung up that way just to preserve the bike. And if it was Bill that did it, it was almost like he knew what was going to happen to him next. So I didn't mention this yet, but the bike was stored at Bill's mom's house, which, which makes sense. Then Bill's mom said, do you, do you, do you just want to take a picture of it or do you want to buy it? So Buzz and his wife, with great consideration, agreed that if Buzz didn't buy this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, that she would never hear the end of it. So he bought it. And just when they got it loaded up in the trailer, the seller, Bill's mom, said something that no one ever expected. She said, do you want to buy the other one also? Let's check the spark. Spark check. So should we make sure we have power to here before we go pulling all this? Because if we don't have power to the coil, we sure won't be getting any spark out of the distributor. Don't turn it over, but turn ignition. Okay. Yeah. 12 volts. 12 volts to the coil. 12 volts out of the coil. Okay, distributor. What about now when I turn it off? Is it, does it actually turn off? Does it actually turn off? See if there's any power there. Then we had another problem. It wasn't getting any spark. Hopefully it's not an issue with how I wired the ignition. But until we get spark, this thing isn't going anywhere. 
So as of now, we're not getting any spark to the wires. We are getting spark to the coil and we're checking the uh, the points. Hopefully there's no snakes in there. You're not scared of snakes, are you? I hate snakes. Are you? I don't like snakes. But we did confirm that the ignition was put in, well, that's not the problem as of yet. We ought to be able to pump out fire to the plugs as long as we can get some spark. Hopefully is, is all it is is the spark at the points. Should I turn the key to the on the ignition no, on? No, 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 his hand's on the fan. Oh. No, no, I didn't mean crank uh, it. Like, oh, yeah, points are open right now. There's some corrosion there. Hold on, let me sand these real quick. So if there's a little bit of corrosion on the points, nothing's gonna start. Just bump the starter. Just barely bump it. Okay. Oh yeah, now we got spark at the points. Spark. Spark, spark at the points, yeah. So we got spark. The next thing we gotta do is uh, make sure it's got fuel. So we're gonna put some, uh, put some fuel in the fuel tank. Hopefully the fuel pump is working. It's a mechanical fuel pump and bleed it up through there. We might be getting this thing running very, very soon. All right, so now we're gonna put fuel in this thing. See if we're actually gonna get fuel to the engine. Hopefully the uh, the fuel pump works. That's enough. That'll get us. Crank it. Crank. Should we bleed it to here? Let gravity get it to here? This is using a mechanical fuel pump and the tank is about eight feet away from the carburetor. Yeah, it's coming. Is it? Yeah, here? yeah. No, no, uh, in the fuel filter. Oh, is it? Good. Okay. And if the fuel pump's not working right, we have to replace it or attempt to rebuild it. Both are gonna take a long time. Then while we were trying to prime the system, the very old fuel line sprung a leak, so we decided to replace all the fuel line. Oh, no. What? I think I might have cracked that line I did. So I've ridden my share of sketchy, dangerous motorcycles. I don't know if I've ever been so nervous about riding anything than that, because normally I can, I can strength, I can handle the bike. If that, thing starts, if that thing goes over a couple degrees, I don't know what, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Also, it will guaranteed crush your leg into dust. With that being said, I'm really, really excited to uh, take a first spin and all that stuff. We just gotta get it running first. You got it? Awesome. awesome. Cool, man. Yeah. You too. Absolutely. You too. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Awesome. Cool, man. Thank you so much. So it turns out there was two of them. Now, if you look at this picture, you might make some assumptions as to who Bill Gelbick was. And you'd be wrong. He was born in 1938 in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and was considered by many an engineering pioneer, including his employer, McDonnell Douglas, and a few other government contractors, where he built and designed guidance systems to service an air missile. So yes, the guy who built that bike, that guy right there is the aerospace engineer. And his plan was to build the greatest touring motorcycle on earth, which was fueled by his hatred towards Harley Davidson and their unreliability at that time. Now, Bill didn't just casually ride his bike on the weekends. It's said that he put 20,000 miles on that motorcycle in the first year after building it. So at this time, the world only knew of one of these motorcycles. And now Buzz learns that there's two road dogs. The other one is claimed to be the original However, I have my doubts. The second one was made for his neighbor, but after he built it, the neighbor was like, nah, it's too heavy, I didn't want it. And I feel like this could have been avoided if the neighbor just actually put eyeballs on the one that Bill was riding. So Bo's bought the one that was hanging up, and for eight years, he toured this thing all around the world, showing it to everyone he possibly could. And then the time came where Bill decided to sell it, so he sold it to his buddy named Larry, who borrowed the money from his mom to buy it. And when his mom saw it, she said, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. So Larry decides, well, I'll fix that problem. Took the whole thing apart and then painted it and put it back together because that was the problem of why it was so ugly. As far as we know, no one has ever ridden the bike since, since he put it back together. So the next thing is the brakes. Now both the front hydraulic master cylinder and the rear are just kind of the dead pedals. Hopefully we can bring that back because I mean, I'm, I'm stupid, but I'm not that stupid to ride that thing with no brakes. I'll ride smaller bikes with no brakes. Our man Chris, let's go see how he's going with it. So there's probably only one man in the country and he's dead who's rebuilt more brake master cylinders on Road Dog than my man Chris. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So we spent a lot of time working on the hydraulic ramps because for this bike, that's the kickstand. And if they don't work properly and aren't straight, it can make riding this very, very safe motorcycle extremely dangerous. Because one, you're not able to stop and get off the bike wherever you go, so you have to hold the bike up the whole time. But also, if one of these rams starts slipping down and drops while you're riding it, that could be fatal. Who wants to ride it first? <laughs> this guy. 
That is some serious. Oh, I'm gonna have to get a a man to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There we go. I think you're in spot right there. We're pretty close. They move? Oh, they yeah, moved, moved a bunch. Moved a no, I meant that this is moving now, yeah. which is really it, the most important part, you know. Now the thing about Bill's death just didn't. I didn't like it. It seemed like it was missing something, and I didn't know what it was. I talked to a lot of people, and it wasn't until um, I was with Matt, and we called Doc Hopkins, who was the owner of the other road dog, that he had some very interesting new news that, that I've not heard of before that might explain actually what happened to Bill. And what Doc said was that after he sold his road dog, a guy walked in. He said it was like a grizzly bear of a man. Looked like he stunk. He mentioned he stunk multiple times. So it looks like he just came out of the woods. And the guy was like, "Hey, where's uh, where's Road Dog?" And, I, and the dog was like, "Well, I just sold it." And the guy was like, "Oh, that's too bad." They started talking. That guy knew Road Dog very well. But that guy was Bill's neighbor, and he was he was a young man at the time. And he, he would come in, he would work on, he would work on projects with Bill, and Bill was kind of like his mentor, and he would help him out with stuff. And sometimes Bill's biker buddies would come by, and he would say, hey, you need to, you need to get out of here, you know, you don't want to mess with these guys. He didn't, want, he didn't want this young guy involved in this biker culture. This guy had some information about Bill that no one else had. And what it was, Bill had told him, kind of in confidence, that he had cancer and he wasn't gonna live very long. So that guy, who knew Bill pretty well, seems to think that this might have been a situation of uh, he wanted it to happen, that that makes sense. It's just more rumors to add on to the whole legend of Wild Bill, but it kind of makes more sense than anything else does. Let's go back and see if we can get this thing to run. Are we doing this? Should I pump it or anything? I don't know that pumping it's gonna, well, yeah. The accelerator pump probably doesn't work, but Okay. All right. You guys ready? All right. Fire it up. Throttle open. Yeah. Ready? Go. Ah! Come on. Yes! Ha <laughs> oh, ho! Oh. You're you're in gear. You're in gear. Oh. Oh yeah, you were spinning that throttle and that wheel was moving. That's for sure. Now you're not. What am I in now? You about you about went through the garage door. <laughs> yes. Sounds like a brand new motor, man. So where do you think park is? Okay. Oh. Hey, it's working. Yeah. <laughs> so that one leaks down over there. Yeah. They need to be bled, and they self bleed or something. Smoking. Start it up again, see if it cranks right back up. Yes. It's an automatic choke on it, so. You know what these things do? No. So we got it running, but we gotta see if we can ride it. I, I'm, I can't, I can't not ride it. So, figure out the brake situation, figure out these hydraulics. Also, we're gonna figure out what the, the gears are. I'm gonna go look at this Corvette real quick and see it and make sure it looks just the same. 
Yep, that's what yep. Matt was saying. Yep. Almost the opposite of what you would, uh, what modern day cars are. Chris got back with rebuilding the front master cylinder. Hopefully it works. And then we proceeded to spend the next two hours trying to bleed the front brakes. And the end result is you gotta pump it up a few times and get it to barely stop. That should be good enough. The bike was sold to John Parham, uh, who's the owner of JMP Cycles, and it was put in his Iowa Museum, where it was expected to live forever, dormant to never run again. The other one bounced around a few owners and most notably ended up with Doc Hopkins. But more recently, he just sold it to a private collector where no one's really heard from it since. But the big question is what happened to Bill or how most people know him as Wild Bill. Now, there are a lot of rumors around Bill's untimely death, but the facts are Wild Bill was shot dead by police at his house in Green Bay, Wisconsin at the age of 40. Now, some of the rumors are that the police thought that Bill was smuggling drugs with his tractor trailer and that one of the police officers had bad blood against Bill because something happened in high school, Bill took that guy's girlfriend or they got into a fight or something like that. The other rumors that the cops came originally because they suspected that he was transporting drugs. The other thing was that Bill just got a gun and he was shooting up in the air and the cops came because the neighbors were complaining. So one story is that the, the cop with bad blood shot him in the back. The other story is that Bill had the gun in his hand, not really de-escalating anything. And one of the police officers slips and falls on ice. The other police officers assume that he just got shot from Bill and then they all light him up and they shoot him. So depending on who you talk to, Bill shot a guy or Bill didn't shoot a guy. So depending on who you talk to, it's some variation of those, of those different pieces all put together in one story. But when I hear it though, something just doesn't feel right. I feel like we're missing something. Man, I am so, I'm so excited and very nervous about getting this motorcycle running, but I can't wait. It's going to be cool, but I need a water break real quick. I always, uh, I always learned from my, from my dad, he'd always be drinking tons of water, big old giant jugs of water, that water is the best thing for you. You got to drink a lot of water. That's what, that's what keeps you healthy. And I like water. I do drink a lot of water, but sometimes I want to mix it up. So, you know, a lot, a lot of times I've been doing something like this, right? I put some, I put something in the water to make it taste a little bit better. But the problem with something like this is there's something, I'm putting something in there. There's a chemical in there. And so makes it not as healthy as just drinking water. And that's what's pretty cool about Arup. Arup is a sponsor of this uh, this video. I'm very, um, I'm grateful for that. And the cool thing is you have these flavor pods and you put them right here. They just go on like this. They have a little hole right there. You put them right on there like that and lift it up. And when you're drinking, you, you smell the flavor, but then you, you, your mind thinks that you're tasting it. So what actually, this one actually tastes like blueberry and they've got tons of different flavors. I keep a bunch of these around. You got basil, lemon, you got peach, you got cherry. So they got all the good flavors that you would like. Um, so it's a cool way that you can, you can stay hydrated, not put, not be putting anything other than water in your body. And my kids really enjoy doing it too. It's a good way to help keep a healthy lifestyle. Go check them out. Check out the link in the description. Let's get back to this motorcycle. We're so close. I, I, we're gonna I, we're gonna ride it today. Let's go ahead and roll it out. Go one, two. There you go. I'm cutting it too far. Oh, sorry, sorry. I don't. Yep. Don't worry. We I lost control. <laughs> <laughs> All right, break. That's good. That ought to get us there. So me and Matt are having a little bit of a uh, discussion as to who's gonna ride the bike first. Matt's got a pretty good connection to it because his dad rode the last one. And that's, uh, as far as I know, that's one of the last people who ever rode one of these bikes. You ride it first though, cause you're bigger than me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you wanna do rock, paper, scissors? We could do rock, paper, scissors, man, but I might throw it. You might... <laughs> How do you throw rock, paper, <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors? Best out of one. Okay. Oh, it's always, wait. One, two, three, two, shoot. Three, shoot. Okay, ready? <laughs> One, two, three, shoot. Oh. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. And then it was time. And, and to be honest with you, I was pretty nervous. Not because the bike felt heavy. However, what we realized was that the bike is unbalanced. If you hold the bike straight up, it feels like it's falling over. That's why I was always leaning the bike like a couple degrees to the right. But then when I was holding the bike a couple degrees to the right, someone behind me would think that I'm, if the bike's falling over and they'd be pushing it to the left and it felt heavier than what it was because I'm fighting the guy behind me. We didn't realize that until Matt rode the bike and he noticed the same thing. I was nervous because the bike felt incredibly hard to turn. And normally when you're riding a motorcycle, you know, I know, okay, if I, if I do this, the bike's gonna go this way. Or if I do this, the bike's gonna go that way. This bike doesn't work that way, it's different. And I, I was having a hard time figuring it out. And I was, I was nervous that I wouldn't be able to figure it out while I was in the few moments of me driving on gravel, taking turns, and then pulling out in the traffic. Since then, 
We also found out that every single person who had claimed to ride Road Dog had some type of training wheels or wheeled outriggers on the thing, making it cheating. Let's just be honest, cheating. So as far as we know, no one has rode Road Dog the way it was made, the way Wild Bill rode it. His feet are up! It's still real heavy on the straight on the front end. It's still real heavy on that front end. Yeah? Yeah. Well here, uh, put it in neutral. Back it up. Wow, you gotta be tough, dude. Oh! oh. Ah. Alright. <laughs> <laughs> Is that all I fell over? That's all it went. Yeah. Oh, that makes you feel better, right? Yeah, a little bit. Let me, uh, hold on, let me. Got it? All right. Let's try it again. Okay, now let me make this clear. This was such a huge epic moment that I, I felt selfish and I couldn't, I couldn't take it all for myself. So I had to share this moment with Matt and give him the privilege, no, no, the opportunity to ride this thing. And it had nothing to do with the fact that I was horrified about riding this motorcycle and nothing was working the way was, I thought it was supposed to. And there was a fairly busy intersection 20 feet ahead of me. Nothing to do with that. Also, when I was nine, a witch told me that I was gonna die on Road Dog. It didn't make any sense until now. You sure you didn't win that uh, rock, paper, scissors? I'll win it. You win it? Yeah. All right. Yeah? I'm gonna let the master show me how to do it. We got it? Yeah. Okay. So I gave the bike over to Matt, who absolutely crushed it. It's gotta wobble! Yeah, it does! This is crazy! 100 miles an hour, my butt, dude, no way. This is insane. <laughs> you're doing it. Whoa. Actually, once you're going straight, it's all pretty good. As long as you don't need to make, it, make any quick maneuvers, I mean. Unbelievable, dude. Did that was the scariest <laughs> thing I've ever done. <laughs> and that's, that's saying a lot. <laughs> Dude, and just turning into this parking lot was the scariest thing I've ever done. You crushed it, man. Um, holy smokes, dude. Now driving in the truck while Matt was living out my dream of riding the road dog was a bittersweet moment. I was so pumped. I was so pumped for Matt. He looked awesome riding it. It's the coolest looking thing riding down the road. But I was disappointed in myself. And I knew that I, would, I could never face my kids, face my friends, face my wife, face my family, face you guys if I didn't face my fears. Then something popped in my head. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. Let's go ride the road dog. Okay, Jerry, you might want to move your, your bike. Okay, so look, there's big gnarly stuff. I would take it almost as high up as you can. Okay. You know, don't be in a hurry to turn, but just make sure you make the turn. And then go all the way and come down and maybe try and stay out of all that gravel. Turn before or after or at the Jeep? About at the Jeep's okay. A little before. All right. Ooh, that's reverse. Now go for it.
All right, pop it in. Uh, you want it in low? Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's do low. Go I got it. <laughs> that looks so insane. <laughs> Easy. Easy. And just like that, I was doing it. I had faced my fears, I sucked it up, and I rode the legendary road dog. And in case you're wondering, I started trying to stop here and it actually stopped over here. So that, that's how bad the brakes were. <laughs> is that a handful or what? Dude, turning left is way harder than turning right. Turning left is harder than turning right. Turning left is so hard. What is it with that? I, I, I think it's something with that differential being on that one side and being so big. Oh, that's completely possible, like turning, man. Turning right was like, oh, this is nice. Turning left was like, oh, I'm fighting it, fighting it, fighting it. Well, you got two left turns to get back. <laughs> I lined it right up for you. Me and Matt both fell in love with riding Road Dog, and it was super easy. And we had no concerns about riding at home, making a couple left hand turns, and going through all that traffic to get back to the museum. In fact, we were arguing about who gets to ride at home. So we came up with the only logical solution. <laughs> And I'll never forget the look on those Harley riders' faces when we passed them riding Road Dog. Something that has not happened since Wild Bill himself rode Road Dog last. Guys, go check out Matt's video on Wheels Through Time about this thing. It's a little more in depth on a couple different things. And a lot of footage that we didn't show here is going to be on his video. If you like this video, you're going to love this video right here. We'll see you guys next time.